Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. So um, once again, big thank you to Junior DFSG for supporting uh, GovTech StackX and of course Kai from Mercurix for being one of our speakers as well. So uh, I'm Joyce uh, and together with my colleagues, we run the StackX uh, DevRel work here in GovTech. Uh, next please, Ishu. Thank you. So um, I'll just like to introduce GovTech very, very briefly to you guys. So GovTech is now about um, 3,000 strong and um, our work can actually be broadly classified into um, three areas. So these are products, um, services, cyber and governance. Uh, under the product team, we have over 700 developers who implement products for the WOG, which is um, whole of government and develop um, strategic national projects. So we also have capability centers um, in the areas of digital services, uh, sensors and IoT, uh, data science and AI, cybersecurity and infrastructure. And um, the product team also manages the whole of government infrastructure from our move um, to commercial cloud, to data centers, and, and even to the issuance of uh, devices to all public offices. And um, next up is the services group, which is the biggest of the three. And uh, that makes up more than half of our staff actually. And um, services groups, actually plays an important role in managing technology in over 60% uh, of government agencies in Singapore. And um, finally, the cybersecurity and governance group. Um, so GovTech is actually the sector lead for cybersecurity in the government. And um, the chief information security officer sits in GovTech actually. So um, to ensure all of the work we do is uh, safe and really secure, our governance group actually sets um, ICT policies and guidelines across the government. Uh, thanks, Ishu. Next slide, please. So uh, we would also like to uh, get you guys to join us at the Singapore Government Developer Portal. So this portal is actually um, a single stop to discover the products that we've developed as well as um, documentation that um, you might want to try out. So um, such documentation include um, like national digital identity, um, the API gateway, DevOps products, um, and many, many more. So uh, we also have a community page uh, where we post details of um, the past webinars, uh, which is uh, such as this one, uh, recordings uh, and video on demand, and as well as blogs from um, our GovTech teams. So um, at the moment, our portal is actually in the beta phase. So uh, please be patient with us as um, the info is being onboarded. And uh, if you have any feedback on uh, maybe what you would like to see more or how we can make the entire portal better, please get in touch with us. Thanks, Ishu. Next. So uh, this is where I would like to sell our flagship developers conference a bit. So it's called Stack 2020 and it will be held from 1st to 3rd December this year. So um, this year it will be a fully digital event and um, the good news of course is that it's free to attend for all. So um, some of our notable speakers will include uh, Minister Vivian, uh, Martin Fowler, Jean Kim and many more as you can see um, on the screen. So uh, we actually have a thriving um, developer community in Singapore and even beyond. So um, through Stack we actually uh, hope to encourage the developer community to share and learn together. So, um, and also over the years, GovTech has actually developed many products um, in consultation with community and um, getting at, at Stack, X 2020, uh, Stack, sorry, Stack 2020, it's really our chance to um, share some of these products and experiences with you. So um, as you can see from the QR code on screen, our registration is already open. So you can just scan the QR code on screen um, to register your interest. Uh, next please, issue. So um, one very important thing that we would like to tell everyone is that during this period, we really want to support um, the tech community. So uh, if you can just scan the QR code now, you will be able to see um, the full listing of jobs that uh, we have. So um, at the moment, we have about or close to 400 perm and contract positions. So, um, you know, whether you're a software developer, a software engineer, DevOps engineer, or any other business analyst, um, you should be able to find something interesting. So, um, while some of the positions are for Singapore citizens and perm permanent residents, uh, we are very open to considering uh, foreigners with niche skill sets. So um, if you or you know of any other friends who might be keen or have been displaced during this period, uh, please, please share this link with them. Okay, and on to my next slide. Thanks, Ishu. So uh, finally, if you have not done so, um, please join us at um, the StackX community. So um, as part of our commitment to engage developers and would-be techies like yourselves uh, more, we actually formed the StackX community last year. So you can just scan the QR code on screen now to join uh, our StackX Telegram channel. So this is where we will share the latest information um, on deep dive StackX sessions, 
uh, with government as well as private sector professionals who would share on um, a really wide range of topics. And um, thank you very much for listening. This is the end of my introduction. And uh, we are excited to have Shane Wu from GovTech to share with us how he successfully took the plunge uh, well into the tech industry from a non-tech background, which um, some of you mentioned that you're interested in, and um, also cross-tech domains in GovTech. So thanks everyone again. Okay, um, thank you, Joyce. So these are two speakers for us today. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen first so that uh, Shane can share his screen. Okay, so um, introduction of Shane first. So um, Shane graduated from the NUS Business School in 2018 with a degree in business administration. Despite his non-technical background, he realized that he wasn't that interested in a traditional business career and wanted to pursue tech. Fortunately, by picking up skills through self-study, he was able to make the leap to join the GovTech tech program. There, he spent, the he spent the first two years as a cybersecurity specialist doing threat hunting under the government IT security and incident response team and has recently joined the data science and AI division as a quantitative analyst. This cross-domain exposure has given Shane valuable experience and a unique perspective of how tech can be integrated. And yeah, take it away, Shane. Okay, thanks, Ishu. Uh, yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Shane Wu. Uh, so today I'll be sort of sharing with you guys a bit about my journey. Uh, uh, I think that uh, they've already introduced uh, a bit of my background, <clears throat> so I, I won't go over that too much. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, I will say that I don't think that the experience is as grand as, as the topic title kind of makes it out to be. Uh, I think each step along the way is like, you know, it's like one step at a time. Lah, and then I guess only when you look at it, the aggregate, then uh, it looks like it is quite a big difference. So, but. Okay, yeah. So uh, as mentioned, I, I think that the first kind of unusual thing is that I graduated from uh, NUS Business Administration. And this is, of course, not something, it's not a degree which, uh, you know, you would expect someone working in the tech industry to have. Uh, and I recall that the reason why I even chose to do NUS business in the first place was because, honestly, I had no idea why I wanted to, like, what I wanted to do, like, you know, for the rest of my life, right? So, like, the standard thing, if you don't know what you want to do, you choose a general degree because, you know, hey, if you have a business degree, you can kind of, like, do anything, right? So, that was kind of the thought process I had back then, right after I, I, I graduated and when I was in army. So yeah, that's why I applied for business. Uh, I will say it's fortunate because, you know, uh, I mean, sort of like discovered the direction I wanted to go towards while studying business. I think I'll talk a bit about that later, right? But I mean, it was fortunate that I discovered that interest. Therefore, I could take the steps to, you know, slowly pivot from doing pure business towards trying to break into tech. Yeah. And as mentioned, you know, I have sort of like now cross domain functional experience across two domains, cybersecurity and data science. And these are two domains, which I think actually, actually all the domains, right? Like if you think about it, like they, they sound a little bit like different, right? Like this thing is, you're not sure like where the overlap for, for these two sort of skill sets can come in at first glance. But I think that uh, there are, there are ways that there's, there's a stronger overlap that might be uh, first thought. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let, let me talk a bit now uh, of the details, like how exactly that sort of transition happened from that starting point from an uh, NUS business uh, undergrad, right? And I think that a lot of these principles may apply because uh, I came from a non-traditional background with non-traditional, like, like without the, the foundation. Right? I didn't have that starting point of like studying computer science or computer engineering. But uh, I think what really kind of like made a difference is like, taking the effort to put like to do those small things that show that you're interested in that transition. So like taking the time out of your day to like self-study or whatnot, like when you, when you show interest and you pick up these kind of things by yourself, then uh, yeah, I think that those are like the important steps. So uh, in this tradition journey, I think there's a few main pivoting points, right? The first key point is that uh, when I was studying business, uh, there's quite a few different things that the business school kind of teaches, right? There's like marketing, there's like finance, there's like uh, management, human resource kind of stuff. But uh, one part of it uh, related, uh, there was supply chain management and then there's business analytics. And this sort of field is more mathematical than more technical, right? 
I think nowadays also like you know businesses in general are trying to like leverage data, uh, trying to 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 do data analysis uh, more, right? So this was kind of like following those kind of thought process, right? Like maybe to to justify how to to uh, through certain business processes, how to optimize certain business processes. So that was like what business analytics is about. Like. So there's some statistics and like queuing theory, that kind of thing. And I found that one like really very enjoyable because like, you know, it's very quantitative. And I mean, I guess everyone here will also appreciate the quantitative things, right? Those, uh, as opposed to like, you know, the qualitative, very fluff courses, you know, like where you just like say things and it's all about the, how you say things, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, that, that was sort of like my sort of direction of like, hey, you know, I don't want to do all that qualitative stuff. I want to do more quantitative stuff, right? Uh, and that's where the interest kind of sparked up. And then, I mean, even though the business degree doesn't offer it, so the first thing I did was like, I tried to take as many electives uh, as I could to, to learn more about this. Uh. So the first thing was that I went to take statistics electives, which I think like a lot of people in my cohort also looked at me like I was insane right? because who wants to do statistics? Or, uh, yeah. But then, yeah, so that's why I, I started to pick up, you know, and I, I was trying to deepen my, so I wanted to do more business analytics. Then I realized to do business analytics, you actually need some programming. You need to know R and statistics. So you need to deepen your technical capability. And then I started to look into like online courses. Uh, so actually, if uh, if uh, anyone here is not like that, has not taken that step or doesn't have that foundation uh, in computer science or programming, right? I would recommend uh, CS50 on EDX because to date, to date, until now, uh, I think that this is by far the best online course I've ever taken, right? Uh, it's the productive value of this course is, is really quite safe. Like, I can't believe it's available okay for free, that kind of thing. Uh, but of course, the caveat is that it really takes up a lot of time because I think that the content is really heavy. Like, uh, like I, I put here, right, I think it took, take, took at least or more than two modules from NUS, right? So it's like twice the workload. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's heavy because it goes into all that detail that you need. Uh, right? So I learned like, as a, I learned about you know, low level stuff, pointers, arrays, uh, that kind of thing. So I got that foundation. Yeah. So I think that one helped me to sort of like, like these kind of steps, uh, I get to build my general technical competency. Right. And then the next uh, sort of like important turning point then is that when I had internships, uh, because internships is how you sort of transition from a technique, like, uh, you know, you, you try to, you are able to translate these into actionable like, business, like you, you can actually work on them uh, in real life. Right? So it's no longer theory, right? it's now more practical stuff. Right? Yeah. So uh, the first internship I had with Singtel, I would say that I worked as a business analyst and it wasn't that technical, but if I didn't have that first internship experience, right, I probably wouldn't get the second one. Now. So, you know, it's all kind of interlinked, right? So that's where like, you know, one step at a time kind of thing. And I would say that the second one was where I sort of like, after that transition is when it felt, you know, I'm more comfortable saying that, you know, I'm technically capable, right? So because before that, it was all just like courses and stuff. Right? But when I was working here, uh, and I'm fortunate because my boss at the time pushed me quite hard to not work on a lot of different things. So for example, right, like before that I had never touched Python, but because they use Python, I had to learn Python and I had to do almost everything in Python, right? You know, then there's, they, they were working with like different databases and to interact with the SQL databases. I worked on building dashboards. I even built like a web app, right? Because I, I can't remember the reason why, but she was trying to present some claims data on a web, like a web interface, right? So I actually had to host that web server and like host the web app. So I built everything and then like, you know, you can run that small little flask thing and then you, you, you show like, oh, you know, this is the different kind of things thing. So I think that's quite cool. Uh, yeah. And I mean, just having this diverse variety of experience uh, and it's not kind of like, you know, it's very actionable, very real, right? Then like, yeah. So as mentioned, like that, that sort of like gave me the confidence to say, hey, I'm actually like building up the skills. Well. And I think that because of that, uh, that sort of like allowed me to pass the GovTech technical test. Uh, because the test was in Python, right? So if I, yeah, if I didn't have Python, I probably wouldn't be faster. <laughs> yeah. But so even after I got in though, uh, you know, learning kind of never ends, right? Because after all that transition from business to tech, I still am now just in the interest of tech, right? And especially my learnings is pretty general, I think. So it's like, I'm kind of learning what a computer science should learn, but 
I joined cyber, right? And there's quite a lot of cyber specific knowledge that you need to learn. And then now I'm in data science and there's different like, skill set. Of, yeah. But, but before I go into that, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about how cybersecurity kind of works. So um, like a brief overview of like, uh, yeah, the different kind of functions in cybersecurity. So um, cybersecurity can be kind of broadly subdivided. There's, there's two main sort of categories, right? There's the red team. Uh, and this the red team is more offensive. So uh, basically it's hacking to test your defenses. So if like you build a web app, um, how do you make sure that it's built securely? I mean, you're not going to like, go through line by line and then reread everything to make sure it's like there's no errors, right? So uh, what they do is that they have penetration testers that come in to hack your website uh, to test if it's work, uh, working away. And if they manage to hack in, then of course, you know, they found a hole in so that there's a way uh, you need to go and fix that. Now. Yeah. So that's that's basically how red teaming works. And then it's the blue team, which is the defense side. So uh, I mean, the blue team is the one where you set up sort of like your permitted defenses correctly. And you set up your firewall rules, that kind of thing. And then you monitor them. So you want to see like, okay, uh, is the network traffic going to look reasonable? So like you expect to see a certain rate of network traffic, but it suddenly spikes, then, okay, you know, maybe this is because it's like a DDoS attack or something. So like that kind of monitoring stuff. Yeah. Uh, I will say though that uh, uh, I think, well, especially when I last time when I was telling people that I used to work in cybersecurity, they would think like, oh, you know, I would just sit in front of a monitor like for eight hours straight and I just stare at the screen and see, oh, is everything okay? Uh, yeah, but well, that's not why I, I did. Or, or even worse, like, you know, they, they see it, they're like, oh, you know, you're the guy who sets up the, the rules to say that you can't browse uh, Google, uh, you, can't, you can't use Facebook at work because there's a security risk or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I wasn't doing that kind of thing. Uh, actually, I was inside the incident response team, which is, I think this is kind of, this is, uh, it's a necessary function, but I think most people don't think of this when they think of cybersecurity. Uh, so uh, what exactly uh, did I do in uh, the incident response team? Uh, what exactly is incident response about now? Uh, in GovTech, uh, we have this team, the JITSA, uh, Government IT uh, Security Incident Response Team. And basically what this team is, is kind of like the center of excellence for, for uh, incident response across the whole government. So uh, basically if there's a security incident uh, in any agency, then there's this centralized team to sort of handle that. So they escalate it and then JITSA will be the one to investigate to see what happens. Right. And I mean, the whole purpose of this is that if there is a successful security breach, right? Then, you know, you do the analysis to understand how did this happen? You know, what did they, did they get away with anything? That kind of thing, like, so uh, it's kind of important to, to understand like, basically. Yeah. So it's kind of like a crime scene investigation but in the digital space from right? the yeah. uh, Inside the incident response team, there's quite a lot of specialized skills. So for example, uh, digital forensics or malware analysis, right? So malware analysis, like if you have that malware, like the, the program, you can like try and run it or even reverse engineer it to find out, you know, what is the program trying to do or even like try to reverse engineer the code so you can scan the code to see what it's doing. Yeah. But uh, the common kind of skill set required for this team, I believe, is log analysis. Because uh, everyone needs to, do, to read logs at some point because logs are what really uh, mark down what the computer is doing and what anybody is doing on the computer. And the Interest, and, and I raise this up, right, because I think that this is uh, one example of where there's a carryover, especially right, between cybersecurity and incidents, because logs are just a form of data. And having the ability to, to understand data, the data literacy is kind of, uh, I mean, it's a really common skill set, like, because, like, because I'm comfortable with scanning logs and like, extracting relevant information. I'm also comfortable with scanning like large data sets and then understanding like what's important to build my data sets models so, or like, what's important to the end user to to like to optimize like, that kind of thing. Right. And there's also like the processing of handling of data, right? Because like, I mean, if you want to ingest a lot of logs from a lot of different agencies, right? Half the time they're not going to have the same format because they're all using different kinds of software or different versions or whatnot. But you have to still do the same thing on all of this. So you have to build a very strong data pre-processing pipeline. Right. So for my team there, we use the ELK, but I mean, this is the same, the same thought process, right? When you're doing data science, you also have to have a very strong data processing pipeline because data cleaning is like what 70% of the work, right? So uh, in that sense, you know, hey, it's actually a surprising wow, like, like even though these two functional domains are very different. Yeah. 
Okay, so back to when I first joined, uh, uh, when I first joined cybersecurity, I first joined the incident response team. Right? I do want to say though that like, uh, it was kind of like a, a shock in some sense. Right? Because um, when you do cybersecurity, I think there's quite a lot of specialized knowledge that you need. Uh, and maybe this kind of knowledge is taken for granted at some level for home science students. Or because, uh, for example, like when you learn about networking protocols, right? It's like, okay, you know, computers can talk to computers or the internet is made out of TCP, IP, HTTP, this kind of thing, right? I had absolutely zero knowledge of all of this when I first joined. Right? I think it was to the extent uh, where, if I remember correctly, when I first joined the incident response team, I did not even know the difference between private and public IPs. So I had no idea, you know, there were specific ranges reserved for private IPs, right? So it's like, what? Wow. No wonder the IPs were looking, the connections were like following these rules that I had no idea of. Right? So then that's why like this kind of thing, like, oh man, I needed to learn all this kind of like uh, stuff quite quickly. And I guess to make matters worse, right? Like you don't only need to know what these kind of things are. You also need to know how they behave, what is normal and what is abnormal, right? So, I mean, can you imagine like, you know, you do any of this and then you join and then you're actually asked to assist with the investigation. Well, you know, you know I have no idea where to start. Like, oh, you know, oh, this one, look at this one. <laughs> Yeah, so that was, that was quite challenging. I remember that. It's quite fun, but I mean, it's challenging. Yeah. So um, I will say, though, that um, I felt that that knowledge never really helped me back that much. Even though I, I, said, I, I just said that, you know, it was quite a challenge to learn about all these kind of things. That said, I still felt like I could contribute, even though I wasn't very strong in that aspect. And I felt that, you know, I can contribute mainly because I will contribute by by having a good, like big picture view, a good analytical view of the process. Because, I mean, like you find these kind of clues, um, it's, it's good to know, like, you, I mean, you need the technical skills to identify these kind of things. But to put that, put those clues together into a coherent picture of, you know, like what was the attacker doing? Like, what was the entire plan? You know, what, what were they trying to do? What are they trying to use? Like, that's, that's different from the technical skills, right? So the technical skills kind of facilitate that, but you know, having that overarching view to put those different pieces together, I felt like that was how I was able to contribute. And I feel like this is a skill that's probably more important because like, you know, it's this is like what comes next after you have that foundation. Yeah. I will say though that like, I mean, it, it's, it might be partially because of like that, but also partially because I had very good uh, colleagues. So, I mean, I, I always knew that, you know, my colleagues at CSG, like, they, they kind of had my back in the sense of like I had no idea, you know, what this kind of uh, specific malware was trying to do. Or I have no idea, you know, how does this system log this kind of certain event, right? I could always ask them for help. And they will always be able to like, sort of like make up for uh, whatever I didn't know. Lah. So in that sense, we were able to cover for each other. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, I guess the CSG was also very good in like, learnings because, I mean, I learned from my colleagues, definitely. I learned from them. Uh, because they would always teach me whenever we we did uh, work together. But I mean, I also learned a lot because the, the department as a whole is, has a very, very, very strong emphasis training, right? So like, you know, it's like you for security, you send you a lot of courses, you take a lot of certifications, you go for conferences, this kind of thing. And that kind of really builds up your sort of foundation, your, your situational awareness. So, I mean, I felt like in, well, being sent for all this, like, I mean, it's, well, after looking back, you realize that, Oh man, how much information was actually downloaded into me during that first year? So, uh, so I mean, other than that, I mean, uh, there's also opportunity for softer skills. Uh, if you're the kind that's interested in that, I mean, I'm not sure if everybody is interested in building up that kind of presentation skills or whatnot, like what I'm doing right now. Right? But uh, yeah, I mean, there's also opportunities for that because I think if you go for conferences and there's also the ability to present at said conferences or get stack. You know, we have some people presenting a stack. Uh, or just even in internal presentation, like this, this, that, this, that uh, opportunity for development as well. And then, I mean, looking back, I guess, like, you know, this kind of incident response experience was really quite a lot of fun because it's kind of problem solving in the way. Right? And I mean, it's like, if you're that kind of person that, you know, you, you like to solve problems, like you like to solve that, like 
you know, you have that problem, you just want to solve it, and it's like it's an itch that you to scratch, right? And you just keep keep doing it, right? Yeah. So I mean that that was kind of how it was like for me. And so whenever there was a case, you know, it, it's I mean you have there's a time pressure to solve it, but it's also like an internal like, well, I want to figure out how it's done. And it's kind of like playing a game in a sense, right? So yeah, I, I I enjoyed that quite a lot. Yeah. So uh it's kind of shameless self-plug. Um I, I put this out here because uh, those of you who are familiar with cybersecurity, uh, you might know of what capture the flags are, CTFs, right? So capture the flags are basically sort of like, these are more red team events. So the competition organizer, typically they will host machines and inside the machines, there are different flags, right? Maybe a different, different files with different secrets, or maybe like you have to access certain folder or whatnot, right? Uh, those are flags. and people compete to see who can capture the most flags by hacking into the machines and gaining privileges. So that's how I think CTFs felt like originally occurred. And I think they're still mainly along this line, but there's also blue team CTFs. So the one uh, that I'm talking about here is opening as bicycle uh, and it's called boss of the sword. Okay. So in the picture you see uh, that is me with my team uh, when we were competing at the uh, Splunk boss of the sword uh, 2019. Uh, Singapore. So, I mean, we took this picture because we won uh, the Singapore region, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's quite a lot of fun to, to try this also right? because you can get uh, lots of nice experience. But I mean, I also somehow or other, you know, I came in and um, I mean, we were able to compete at Singapore level and do quite well. Uh. There's also one that actually just happened recently. Swan holds a Conf 20, uh, Swan holds their annual conference. Uh, it just happened, I think, uh, maybe just, it's actually still ongoing, right? But there's also another boss of the salt there, which uh, I went with the rest of my team. Uh, and I won't say how well we did because that would be another self plug but if you're interested, you can go and Google it. Uh, I think the results are out. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, that is uh, what I sort of experienced, how I learned and you know what, what I did in uh, cybersecurity. And now I've rotated uh, to data science. Um, so, uh, what is so so data science basically? Then data science is trying to achieve two main objectives. Uh, the first objective is to uh, assist in driving better decision making, and extracting the insights from data. Because I think that you know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information locked up because like you know, there's a lot of data everywhere, but no one's really looking at it, right? So, if you're able to sort of like unlock that that information and use it, then you know, we can make uh, better policy decisions as a whole. Uh, and the second main objective is to uplift the general capabilities of uh, all government agencies or uh, officers who, you know, uh, assess and anal uh, analyze data, right? So just dem like democratize the data so that everyone can do their own data analysis. So, yeah. And I think that, you know, me rotating from cybersecurity to data science is quite uh, unusual and it's quite interesting because this is like a living example that, you know, if you really wanted to, at least within GovTech, right, you can have this experience to try different uh, capability centers. Because uh, right? like, it might be just my impression, but I was trying to imagine like, if you do this outside, really, are you going to be able to switch from cyber to data? You know, it, it seems a bit far-fetched, uh, but I mean, I was able to do it here. Uh, yeah. That being said, of course, I don't think it was uh, quite so easy because uh, there's still a certain expectation for competency because uh, when I wanted to rotate, uh, they gave me the same technical test that they give to all hires. Now. So it's like if you apply from outside or internally, you still have to pass that, that technical test. Uh, yeah. And but I mean, I guess because of my background, when it first started from as well, it's like interest because uh, even when I was in cyber, I was still reading up about analytics, but I was able to sort of like keep up, you know, able to, to pass that test. That's why I'm here now. Uh. I'm not, I haven't been here for that long because I only rotated out of cybersecurity and into data science uh, in August. So right now it's, it's been less than three months. Uh, but uh, even in that short time, actually, I think that this, uh, like it, it's, it's been surprising how much stuff that I learned in cyber has come in handy in data science. And I mean, I think it's also because like when you do, when you're in data science, you don't just do data science work. You have to do all that supporting stuff. You need to be be aware of like networking. Like if you want to host your data science model on 
AWS, for example, then you need to know how the networking works. And I really leveraged uh, leveraged a lot of my knowledge from what I learned from from cybersecurity because we had to learn all these things, how they work to to investigate them. Uh, so I think that you know that it, that was really surprising. And I think as as time goes on, I might even find more ways that this kind of uh, competencies overlap. And, and in fact, I, I think that previously I mentioned that um, the most important thing that I felt for doing instant response was that critical thinking, that, uh, that logical analytical thinking, right? And I feel that that's also the same in data science, right? Because, I mean, if you're familiar with data science, right? If you want to build a machine learning model, I think it's pretty straightforward. You just you just have the package, you just run it. But what makes the, the difference between a, a, like a good or bad data scientist is not whether you can run the model or not, right? But if you really understand the data and what problem you're trying to solve, right? So, and, and that that is still the same kind of thinking. I feel like that is sort of like universally applicable everywhere. Yeah. So the analogy that I, I used was that, you know, it doesn't really matter what programming language that you you, you know, right? But as long as you know how to program well, it carries from, you know, across all domains. Uh, yeah. So I think that, that that's like one way that, you know, it like shows how the thinking kind of carries forward and is useful to everywhere. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, I think that was, that's about it for my sharing. Yeah, so so that, that brings me to the end of my journey. So now uh, here I am. Uh, I'm not sure, if, are we doing questions now or is that like all afterwards? Uh, all afterwards. Okay, okay, can. Yeah, thanks. So uh, yeah, that, that's about it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.